Thank you all again for coming. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is A.G. Laffley, and uh, I'm here with Bill Waddell and Jeannie Perales and with Lori Denny, who's in the back. You have the entire Bay Parks Conservancy team with you this afternoon. Um, I want to recognize and welcome Stevie Freeman Montez, Stevie and Steve Cover, who are here, and two of our many partners at the city. Um, this is a partnership between Community City and uh, Conservancy that's now been going on for, well, since November 2013, if you count the original formation of the Bayfront 2020 Coalition. Um, let me get going. Whoops. I went too fast. Um, this is a public meeting. Um, hopefully you got one of our invitations, either the notice and invitation from the city or the notice and invitation from the Conservancy. We try to announce broadly and we're really happy that you were able to come out and join us. Uh, we're going to do three things this afternoon. Bill is going to update us on uh, progress with development and build out of the first phase of the park and actually some little pieces and parts and parcels we've been able to add to the landscaping and the green space. Um, I am going to take us all through the implementation agreement, which is the agreement that's part of the partnership agreement with the city for actual governance, management, operations, and maintenance of the park. Uh, once we finish the first phase next, next summer and open it to the public, and then Jeannie Perales, our our latest addition, our chief experience officer, is going to take everybody through a preview of what a day in the park um, activation and programming might look like in the year ahead. So without further ado, Bill. Good afternoon. Good to see everybody. Appreciate you, uh, you coming out. It's nice to actually be in a live, in-person, public uh, workshop. We had many of these, of course, in the beginning, and we've been having to call an audible uh, the last year and a half or so. Um, if we could, oh, I've got the clicker here, you're right, thank you. Terrific, terrific. So many of you have seen uh, probably this uh, view from the northwest of the existing site. Um, since our initiative started uh, to today, we've accomplished a, a couple of really important things. First of all, we've preserved and conserved this 53-acre publicly owned site to remain a publicly owned site by the city, which is a, a huge accomplishment. Um, and that site, of course, includes a half a mile of shoreline along uh, our beautiful bay. And so um, I always like to remind uh, everyone that this is one of the most, if not the most important thing that our initiative has been able to accomplish as we continue down this path to build a great park. And of course, uh, uh, four or five years ago, uh, the, uh, a series of half a dozen guiding principles were established and approved by the City Commission. And we uh, use these and, and have them guide everything that we do, every step of the way from design to activation. Um, but the, the, in particular, the ones that have always stood out to me are uh, you know, creating and building a, a green and blue oasis that's environmentally sustainable, um, and uh, creates a, you know, an amazing uh, site. Uh, second is a place that's connected and accessible, free and welcoming to all in our community. That's a, a, an incredibly important uh, principle. And then lastly, uh, as a person who's designed a lot of parks, uh, uh, designing it in a way uh, and maintaining it in a way that is economically sustainable in perpetuity. Of course, on the left is the uh, aerial from about 20, uh, 2018, and on the right is uh, the approved master plan, approved in 2018 unanimously. Um, and uh, again, the one on the left is a uh, color aerial, and I'll remind everyone uh, that this site is about two-thirds parking lot, and uh, when uh, that, along with the roofs, along with the half-mile stretch of US-41 next to us, um, drains over 70 million gallons of untreated polluted stormwater into our stretch of the bay every year, every year, four decades. And so as we convert this from two-thirds parking lot to two-thirds green park, we are pre-treating every drop of that stormwater will go through our treatment train. And so we're very proud of that. I always like to say that I'm as proud of, almost as proud of the environmental restoration work that we're doing as uh, the great community park uh, that we're building. 
Um, our approved master plan, um, many of you of course know, but there are a lot of amazing features for uh, all ages uh, and for all incomes, again, free and welcoming to all. Uh, there will be uh, lots, we've got a lot of feedback that folks of course like to be along the water, and so we'll have miles of boardwalk and waterfront trails, we'll have playgrounds uh, for families, uh, we'll have outdoor event lawns, and then we are already have started design on uh, a revitalized cultural uh, uh, district that uh, to celebrate the cultural history of this site and uh, the three National Register buildings uh, that exist on this site. And of course, this is sort of that same view from the Northwest um, that shows the revitalized uh, and enhanced uh, canal district and boat ramp um, that is going to be a really important and active way for folks to come to and uh, from the side and to get access to the water. And then, of course, our phase one, which is in the southern end of Boulevard of the Arts, which I'll talk more about that. Um, from the beginning, this has been a three way partnership between the city of Sarasota, our nonprofit Park Conservancy, the first Park Conservancy in Florida, and the community. And so our team at At Large and AG and Jeannie and others have worked really, really hard to listen from the beginning, ask our community what you want, incorporate that into our plans, ask, uh, make sure that that's what folks want. And we've even gone through a survey process that Jeannie and AG are going to talk about that uh, ask folks what they want to see in their park. Um, and the fact that over our three or four years, uh, we've uh, had over 180,000 total connections uh, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I've never had worked on a, pro a park project that's like this. And so we're, we're very proud of that, and we will continue uh, to listen to our community. Um, I'm also proud, as I said, of the uh, uh, fiscal responsibility that has been a part of our initiative from the beginning. Um, as we've said, uh, our entire build out of our park, about $150 million or so in, in 2018 dollars, is 50% uh, public funding from a dozen different sources or so, and 50% private philanthropy. The first phase we're building with about 80% private philanthropy, and to date we're ahead of schedule. We've fundraised over $25 million of, of private funding, um, and which is more than enough for us to, to build out uh, our first phase of our Upland Park that is under construction. This is, of course, a, 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 an enlargement of our first 10-acre phase. Um, the uh, mangrove walk portion, many of you I know have walked, because I see a number of you over, uh, from time to time, uh, a, a beautiful half-mile stretch that includes um, just about as much money on water quality improvements under the ground that you can't see as, uh, as, you, as there are above ground improvements. The upland portion of the park uh, is uh, well on its way to, um, you know, under construction and it will com be completed summertime next year. So it'll be fun to welcome you all to uh, ribbon cutting sometime next summer on the upland part of the park. Um, and then we've already started design, as I mentioned, on the historic district and the western coast uh, up the waterfront. Um, and then our sunset boardwalk uh, is in for permit application with the Corps of Engineers. And uh, when that pops out in the next year or so, then we'll begin construction of that from the water. Um, and I mentioned some of the improvements we've already completed. Uh, I also see uh, many of you walking around the beautiful one-acre fountain garden that we restored, over a hundred-year-old um, uh, pond and Japanese lantern uh, that we restored about a year and a half ago. Uh, it has Wi-Fi, it has music, um, and uh, connects to uh, the mangrove walkway, again, half-mile, ten-foot-wide pathway uh, that includes a substantial amount of water quality uh, improvements as well as state-of-the-art lighting uh, and beautiful uh, uh, Florida-friendly landscaping. And it also includes uh, half a dozen or so uh, educational decks that have been etched beautifully with flora and fauna that you might see on your stroll. And this one's one of my favorites where we've got a swing uh, that is looking into uh, one of the fingers of the mangrove bayou at the new paddle launch that is uh, almost complete and will be opening by the end of the year. And of course, this is one of my favorite views, looking to the west. Another important part of our phase one is the iconic uh, shade structure covering the concession and restroom area at the east end of our uh, upland part of phase one, uh, designed by our uh, local partner architect, Sweet Sparkman. 
and this is another view of it, uh, the team was inspired by the original field theory design of the old Selby Library that used to inhabit the site, and so they uh, interpreted that and uh, incorporated into the shade structure, including the iconic shade structure, again, at the concession plaza. I mentioned the paddle launch. Uh, any of you that have walked the mangrove walk, you can peek in from the uh, north or south side and see it floating out there, and we're completing some of the connections and the landscaping actually this week went in, and so uh, we're getting uh, really close to actually opening that, and uh, it is, uh, I've snuck down there behind the fence and stood on it, and it is a magical place uh, in the morning and evening to go down and watch the, the flora and fauna. We also, uh, I mentioned the uh, polluted stormwater that's been going on uh, for decades. There was three feet of polluted silt in this bayou that we excavated, completed that a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we're just about to remove the, the silt bags, and so we're getting better tidal flow. I've noticed the water in there is already uh, looking clearer, um, and again, it's gonna be a, just a magical spot to launch a, a paddleboard or a canoe kayak or just sort of go hang out and, and enjoy nature. And on the water quality front, we've got a half a dozen uh, different uh, tools that we're deploying from uh, bioswales and ponds and marshes uh, to a 600 foot long denitrification trench uh, that uses sort of a state of the art uh, methodology to pre treat uh, and, and neutralize nitrogen in stormwater, which is a big part of the problem where we have in our bay that uh, can help, can fuel red tide. And then in some cases, we've used uh, what's called a baffle box. This one uh, we have a couple of those that we deployed. It's a very large structure, about 10 by 10 by 12, that has filters in it that actually you put it in line to a stormwater pipe and the dirty water comes in and clean water goes out. And this one we uh, installed, uh, we, we received a $330,000 grant from Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Actually has a glass hood so you can look down in there and see what's going on and how the magic is being treated. And then you can see where it flows right into the mangrove bayou. And in addition to our phase one that is under construction, we, as I mentioned, are working on design of, uh, of future elements of our park. And so we're going to be going up the, the west, what we call the west coast, the west side uh, frontage and doing some uh, sort of quick uh, enhancements, replacing rusty benches, painting old light poles, replacing broken concrete, and doing some other fun sort of activation things that will uh, let you walk along that sort of quarter mile stretch of, of walkway um, and uh, help revitalize that, that western edge. As well as design of the historic district, our team is very excited about uh, some of the things that are, are going to be, we're going to be deploying there in the next couple of years. Um, but a place that celebrates, again, the, the cultural heritage of this site that includes the city's first and second performing arts centers, city's first art center, the city's first chamber of commerce building, the city's first library, and again, three of those are national register buildings. So uh, that's another place that's gonna be sort of a magical uh, walk through history. So uh, again, in wrapping up my portion of this, uh, I'm excited about the progress that we've made. Some of you that I see as I'm walking around, uh, sometimes I feel like we aren't moving fast enough, but as I step back and talk to folks, I realize we're actually uh, gaining momentum and moving pretty quickly. Um, but again, one of the things I'm most excited about is we've, uh, we've conserved this 53 acres in perpetuity uh, as public land, and we're creating a place that is open, free, and welcoming to all in our community. I'm gonna talk about the implementation agreement. Uh, this is a joint working draft that we uh, have been working with the city, actually, with city manager Marlon Brown, with Stevie and Steve, and with a whole host of their colleagues, managers and staff at the city. And uh, the focus of the implementation agreement is on governance, management, operations, and maintenance of the park. And recall, um, we signed a partnership with the city back in the spring of 2019 after the master plan was approved. And uh, we have three responsibilities to the city and to the community. The first bill took us through, which is design, develop, and construct, build out the park itself in phases. The second is to um, fundraise, and we do, a, virtually all the fundraising on the private side um, from foundations, from philanthropists, and frankly, from citizens like us. Uh, you may recall last year, and Jeannie will talk a bit more about this, but over 1,300 members of our community 
where friends decided to become Friends of the Bay in 2020 and make a gift to the park. And um, with the city, we work on uh, grant applications, and Bill mentioned one of them, but this is, has contributed a significant amount of money so far. We have some pending that we think we're gonna receive, and I believe we have grant applications for more than $10 million in right now. So uh, it's, it's important. And I guess the last thing I would say, and this is groundbreaking for this city, this county, and this community, um, the tax increment financing that was approved by the city and uh, the county in partnership last year is going to end up being a huge uh, capital funder of not only the park, but also a new performing arts center should the city decide to go ahead with one in the park. Um, but coming back to the implementation agreement, uh, it's for governance, management, operations, and ongoing maintenance. It uh, governs how the city and the Park Conservancy will do those responsibilities together, who will be responsible for what. Um, it covers the entire park. Uh, we have one park here, we have one public park here. The entire park needs maintenance, the entire park needs to be operated, the entire park needs to be managed, and it needs eventually to be managed as one park. Uh, in concert and, and cooperation with Parks and Rec and the city. Um, this implementation agreement um, was anticipated in the partnership agreement that's now nearly three years old, and this, uh, this implementation agreement will become part of the partnership agreement as it's amended going forward. And I guess the last thing uh, that I should say and that we live every day is that the implementation agreement enables and empowers the six guiding principles that sort of got this whole project kicked off five years ago. As I said, this is the purpose of the implementation agreement. No surprise there. This is an important point. Um, both the city and the Park Conservancy will comply with all city, all parks and recreation, all special event, all ordinances of any kind, regulations, policies, and procedures in the city that govern public parks in the city of Sarasota. Um, having said that, um, the Bay Park will be treated like other similar parks in the city and governed like other similar parks, similar size parks, similarly located parks. And last, and, and this is maybe um, relatively obvious, but the Bay Park won't be required to follow any ordinances, regulations, policies, or procedures that do not apply to uh, public parks. So we're part of the park system. The only thing that um, distinguishes us and, and makes us different from the rest of the park system is that we're developed, we're funded, and eventually we're gonna be operated in partnership with a nonprofit park conservancy in the city working together. Some of the details from the operations agreement and uh, implementation agreement. Operating hours uh, have been set by Parks and Rec. These are the same operating hours for most of the parks in the city. I will say if you are a boater or a fisher person, then you know that in the centennial portion of the 53 acres, you may fish and you may boat between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. It's one of the few exceptions. Um, the second thing that's important that Bill mentioned is the park's been designed for 360 degree access. You can access from the water, you can access from the land, um, by car, by walking, by micro mobility device, pretty much any way you want to, you can come to the park. As I mentioned, there are shared or joint roles and responsibilities for the city and for, the, um, and for the Park Conservancy. For example, traffic management, um, the roads that are adjacent to and around the perimeter of the park are either state-owned and managed like 41 or city-owned and managed like Boulevard of the Arts and 10th Street. Um, the Park Conservancy, Conservancy will be responsible for managing all roadways inside the park all walkways, all MERTs, multi-use recreational trails inside the park. 
um, essential infrastructure, the city man will manage, you know, basic services, and the Park Conservancy will manage enhanced services. So landscape maintenance, as you probably noticed, the city provides basic service. We provide enhanced service already in the Fountain Garden and the Mangrove Bayou. Uh, the city cleans the public restrooms, you know, every day, every week. We'll be checking the restrooms frequently to make sure they stay clean and to the kind of standard that we want to set. Uh, the city picks up recyclables and trash every day. We're going to check and make sure that the park stays clean, safe, and well-maintained throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, the city provides basic safety and security through principally the Sarasota Police Department. We are testing, uh, thanks to a generous gift, about $150,000 worth of video and audio monitoring in the park to see if that provides enhanced security. We worked through the whole design and plan with uh, SPD, and uh, we are all, we're all interested in running the test and, and, and see what we learn. Um, activation and programming, um, special events, which have been, you know, a question that we get asked frequently, will continue to be approved by the city. Uh, yet, on this site next year, there are currently two special events planned. One is a 5K, 10K road race in February. The other is the annual powerboat regatta in June. Um, both of them actually are held in the central and northern part of the site, so we expect the phase one part of the park to be open throughout. Um, but they're big events, and uh, they're well attended, and uh, they always affect entrance and egress and, and, and traffic flow while the event is ongoing. As far as park permits, so you should think of smaller group events, 25 to 75. You know, the city has asked the Park Conservancy to permit those events, exactly the same process they use with Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec permits, park permit events in the city public parks. Uh, some of you know, and how many of you filled out the park user survey that we, oh great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing it. We, uh, we launched the survey in early June. We kept it open through August. We were very pleased to get 2,500 responses. 95% uh, of you who filled out the survey said that you would definitely be visiting the park, and specifically the Bay Park. Half of you said you would be coming on a weekly basis, and a quarter, or actually almost 30% on a monthly basis. Um, the most popular times, as you can see, were early evening, before sunset, at sunset, and, and in the morning. We asked, uh, you know, what were the amenities or features that you were most looking forward to experiencing, and these were the three that consistently uh, came out on the top. Um, the Sunset Boardwalk is, is usually um, chosen by about 80 plus percent of our community. And if you really step back and think about public parks, every survey that we've ever looked at, whether it's the National Parks and Recreation Association surveys, the survey that Sarasota Parks and Rec ran, or other surveys that we've looked at in other cities, people go to public parks because they want to be outside, they want to be in fresh air, they want to be near green space and with nature, um, they want to take a little exercise or just relax, and they want to be with family and friends. That's the principal reason that people come to parks. We, of course, asked you what you would like to do when you come to the Bay Park, and this was uh, the top 10 list, and as you read down it, I think you'll see that about half of the activities are what we call self-directed or self-initiated um, activities. Um, walking, jogging, biking, stargazing, sunset viewing, etc. cetera. Um, but there are also um, other activities, arts and cultural, food and beverage, um, that you're interested in and we're looking at providing. And Jeannie will tell us more about that. Food and beverage, um, the city has asked us to um, review and approve the food and beverage provider agreement for the concession pavilion as part of the implementation agreement. Uh, the city has asked us to administer the two of the site partner leases, 
the Art Center and the um, Sarasota Garden Club, um, both of which are adjacent to, um, to the Blue Pagoda. Not, of course, the Van Wezel, which is city-owned and operated performing arts center, nor the Sarasota Orchestra. Um, and finally, um, the city has requested that we look at this building, both the municipal auditorium and if you've been in the community center and the back half also at the community center, and to begin to think about how we might program it for the benefit of park users beginning next fiscal year or about a year from now. Um, Bill mentioned, I think, that we've already uh, landscaped the lawn just north of here. It, had, it was basically uh, neglected for some time and, and not used. And uh, it was a fairly quick uh, piece of landscaping that, that uh, improves this whole area. We got a grant to landscape uh, the, the right of way along 41. And uh, we're trying to figure out how the Art Deco fountain really works and if we can get it working again. And if we solve that engineering problem, um, we may have a fountain again in front of the municipal, municipal auditorium as it was originally planned. Um, that's all I've got, and it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeannie Perales, our Chief Experience Officer. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I know that many of you know AG and Bill because um, they've been part of this project for so long, and, and I'm new to the project. Um, but I'm not new to town. I, uh, my kids are fourth generation. I grew up here in Sarasota. Um, and I'm very invested in this community and really, really happy to be part of this project. So um, I hope you like what we have in store for you. Um, so as Bill designs and builds a park and AG does all the paperwork and makes sure everything's all lined up, I'm thinking about how we activate the spaces and make it a safe um, and welcoming park for our community. If you think about what does activation mean, um, you know, if you go to a park that is um, quiet, sometimes sometimes seedy things are going on. Um, if you go to public spaces that are underutilized and not cared for, um, sometimes it, it doesn't feel very comfortable for people to be there. And so when we activate spaces, we create safe and welcoming civic spaces through activation. So that's what we're going to talk about. So we've got a lot of sort of... Um, self-guided and self-initiated activities already going on. I think I recognize quite a few of you from just walking yourselves and your animals through the park. I say animals because there is someone who walks a cat I've seen a few times. Um, so we've got our, our t kind of typical walking, jogging, biking activities that are going on already. Um, and then we have some various arts and cultural offerings that um, we've been trying out. And so in the spring, some of you may have come to the Sundays at the Bay. We'll be bringing those back next month. Um, we took a little weather break. Um, and then there's also nature and discovery. So as AG showed you the results of the survey, all of the activities, programs, and events that people sort of said they wanted to do fall into these three categories, and that's how we're looking at activating the park. So as I mentioned, kind of walking, biking, jogging, um, we have that beautiful new trail, which is part of the MERT system, the mixed-use recreational trail system um, for the city of Sarasota. And I think any of you have walked on it, your knees have probably thanked you afterwards because it's a really nice surface. Um, of course, free weekly events, we'll be doing a certain series that'll happen every week, and we'll do certain things that'll happen every month. So we're going to start a Sunsets at the Bay program, which will be the third Thursday. Um, and many of these things right now, until we open the other part of the park, or as we open parts of the park, we'll be using this new lawn that, um, that Bill and his team improved. So I hope that many of you will come to those things. Um, yoga by the Bay, some of you may have been coming to our free yoga classes. Actually, one of our yogis is here. Um, but we've had maybe around 100 people, even through the summer months, uh, coming to in, uh, enjoy yoga by the water, which has been fabulous. Um, and then sunsets. I mean, is there a better place to watch sunsets in town? Um, one of the things that's so great about this 
uh, location is that you don't have to fight traffic to get over to the, the Keys and the beaches. Um, and so we think that this will be a wonderful place, especially for um, people who live and work downtown to uh, experience the sunset. How are we going to pay for free programs, you might ask? <laughs> well, we've been very lucky in that we've had the support of all five of the major foundations in town. Um, and in particular, the Community Foundation of Sarasota County has funded an activation fund for us, um, which is wonderful. And you know, they know how important it is for us to make this a welcoming and safe environment for the community. In addition, we've launched a founding business partners program, and um, I see a couple people in the audience are already um, have joined this program. But we've invited area businesses to invest in an activation fund, and by having a hundred businesses, we'll have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to offer free programs to the community. So that's one way that we can be sustainable. And right now we have our annual, that's the fall, um, annual Friends of the Bay campaign. How many of you in the room are Friends of the Bay? Fabulous, thank you. We really appreciate your support. And I invite all the rest of you to join. It's just $25 for the year. Um, right now we have multiple matches going on. And so um, if you give 25, it becomes 75 like that. It's like magic. So, um, but we hope that you'll consider doing that. Um, when you join, you can opt into our newsletters so that you can stay up to date. We send one out every week. I'm sure some of you have maybe been sick of hearing from us, but we're going to keep sending them. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, it's my pleasure to turn it back over to AG. And we're happy to take questions if anyone has them. We have uh, note cards, and we'll come down and collect them. We got some questions from in writing uh, a couple of days ago addressed to Bill. So while Bill and, and Anon and Lori and Jeannie are gathering the questions from this group, I thought I'd, I'd address uh, these. Um, we also got uh, a copy of some questions that went to the city. Uh, we got a half a dozen questions, and I thought I would uh, touch on them briefly. Um, first of all, um, I want you all to know that we keep track of every question and comment that we get and that um, we share questions that we get and comments that we get with uh, Marlon Brown and Stevie and the city team and they share questions that they get, that the commissioners get, that anybody at the city gets with us. So um, we got a couple of questions about the boardwalk. Um, I don't know if Bill mentioned this, but we're going to complete all of the upland or all of the land side uh, portion of phase one by next June. We've submitted the city approved design and plan for the Sunset Boardwalk to the Army Corps of Engineers, who is the body that will ultimately approve that design and that plan, either as is or with modifications. And that could take up to 18 months. If we hear from them in 12 to 18 months, we believe we'll be able to build it out in about nine to 12 months after we receive approval. So if we open the land side of the park next year in the summer of 2022, we would hope to be able to open the Sunset Boardwalk in the second half of 23 or the beginning of 24. Um, one, this is a comment, not a question. The comment was uh, the boardwalk should be closed to, should ne never be closed to the public and should not be um, reserved for private ticketed or permitted events. Um, Bill and I and Jeannie talked about that. We think that's uh, a very reasonable suggestion. We obviously want to talk it through with our partners at the city, but there are certainly no plans on our part or on Jeannie's part to have a private event uh, on a desirable location like the Sunset Boardwalk. In fact, even when special events, our desire is that the park stays open to the public 365 days a year. And as Jeannie said, our desire is that every event in the park is free. That means if it costs money, it either has to be provided pro bono, it has to be sponsored, or it has to be supported by some form of, of donation or government grant. So that's a good, that's a good idea. Uh, we like it, and we're going to, like I said, we'll share it with the uh, our city partners, who ultimately make the decision on this. I hope you realize that. We, 
we propose, city management agrees or approves, and what they approve is what we take to the city commission, and then ultimately the city commission approves. We have a great working relationship, um, but it's been a partnership uh, every step along the way. Second uh, comment we got was regarding amplified sound um, and whether that should be allowed on the boardwalk. And I would simply say that this is more complicated than it sounds and that the city has uh, a sound ordinance that addresses uh, sound in terms primarily of decibels because whether sound is amplified or not doesn't really determine how loud it is, right? So um, in conversations with city manager Brown, he just has encouraged residents who are interested in the sound ordinance in the city, making changes or amendments to it. Uh, that process is underway. Stevie, I can't remember when it's on the city commission agenda, but I, I, I think it's coming up in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, we got a comment and question about um, coordinating calendars with other organizations on the site. Um, we will continue to do that. Uh, Jeannie is chairing that group. I, I notice a number of our uh, partners on the site are here today. Um, we meet on a regular basis. I, it won't surprise you to learn that it's been a really tough year for some of, uh, for several of the performing arts and, and even, uh, you know, the art center and the garden club because of the pandemic. So uh, we're getting together. We're putting our calendars together. You will see our calendar evolve on the website and um, we, will, we will integrate that calendar so whether you're at one of the residences across the street from the park or whether you're anywhere in the city, you'll be able to come to, to our calendar on the home page and you'll know what's going on this week, this month and for, we hope, uh, two or three months ahead so you can plan. Um, there was a request from, um, in this, correspondence that the city retain all permitting functions. I can simply tell you this was much discussed. Who's going to permit special events and who's going to permit uh, park permits in the park and I won't speak for all of the city because there are only two representatives here but but pretty much I think the city agreed that they should continue with the special events. They're large events. They require more support and more resources from the city. I believe Stevie the city permits over 100 a year already. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary number of special events. And as I said, there are only two planned for our site and not in the first phase. But I don't think the city wants to get into permitting every 25 to 75 person group event in all 40 different parks in, uh, in our city. You know, they delegate that managerial and operating responsibility to Parks and Rec. And like I said, we're, the, we're their Parks and Rec for, the Park Conservancy is their Parks and Rec for this park. So I think that's been the rationale for why we've proposed what we've proposed. City will continue to handle special events. They'll delegate park permits to the Park Conservancy. Um, and then there's another comment about um, ordinances governing hours of operation um, and sound ordinance. Uh, shall not be waived for any events. And I guess that one's I'm, one I'm going to have to talk with the city to. We've said uh, over and over again, both the city and the Park Conservancy, we're going to follow the letter of uh, and comply with every ordinance, regulation, and policy in the city. So I, I don't think there should be any cause for concern here. But I'm not an attorney, and somebody might have read the fine print and there may be some loophole in there about waiving something. So I'm not gonna comment on things I don't know about. I'm gonna defer to the people at the city who uh, can help us with that one. And, and the last, the last uh, comment that we get is one that we've gotten off and on for, for four or five years. And it's just, it's, it's not an easy one because there aren't clear definitions. And um, by way of context and background, Bill and I, and actually Veronica Brady, this last year enrolled in, were accepted by, and completed the Central Park Conservancy City University of New York Public Park Management course. And it was a lot of homework, right, Bill? I don't think Bill did all his because he was busy. Well, I 
But Veronica did it all, and we cribbed from her, right? A little tardy, but I didn't. Yeah. But it was, it was a great course, and uh, as a result of that, we are now, uh, first we all graduated, we're all, we all received our certificate. Uh, we've received followed up certificates for additional courses, and most importantly, we're members of the U.S. Public Parks Alliance now, which gets us access, along with the Trust for Public Lands, to an awful lot of information about public parks across America. So the question that keeps coming up is, park intensity, how many people are going to be here for which events, how much traffic is that going to generate, should there be a passive part of, part of the park and an active part of the park. There just really isn't a good definition of passive v active. Um, we don't know the reason we survey. I mean, we know that 25, out of 2,500 respondents to our survey, 95% say they want to come to the park or they intend to come to the park every week, right? So that gives us some idea that we have a destination and we have a set of features and amenities that have some attraction. But we don't really know until we start to operate what's going to happen. The way this park has been designed and planned, that, that one would be, keep going, Bill, one more. Yeah, one more. Yeah, actually go back one and then I'll come to this one. The way the, the, way the park's been designed, virtually all of the most used activities are in the north end of the site, either north of 10th Street in the what will be new and totally renovated public boat launch area, which attracts thousands of people from the city, the county, and the region every year. A new restaurant and retail area that will go around what we call the canal zone. A much larger boardwalk that will extend, I like to call it the skyline boardwalk, and I'm sure somebody a lot smarter than I am and more creative than I am will come up with a better name, but that is going to provide, it's much larger and it provides much more sweeping views. You can literally see all the way up the bay and all the way to the Skyway Bridge. A much larger lawn for uh, performances that there and up to the northwest, both of which will be adjacent to the new Performing Arts Center, which will be four blocks, three blocks, further north than it is today. So. Mary's not here to correct me. I think 130 to 150,000 people pre-pandemic attended a, at least one event at the Van Wezel at the new Performing Arts Center. That will be more because there's more capacity and they'll do more shows and bigger shows. Uh, I mentioned thousands literally use our public um, boat launch. Um, but most of the activity is going to occur up there. So while we aren't and really can't designate um, this, this lawn is passive and that lawn is active. Um, as Jeannie and our team plan activities, they're going to be more self-guided, self-directed activities in the southernmost part of the bar park. By virtue of the fact that we have the mangrove bayou, that's a quieter venue. Um, the Fountain Garden has been a relatively quiet venue. It doesn't mean we won't have music there. Okay, but the music will be well within the decibel requirements of the city sound ordinance. It doesn't mean that we won't have food and beverage festival there or even a pop-up art festival there occasionally. But this is not going to be the center of most of the activity in this park. It's not the way the park's designed. It's not the way the park's planned. And if you look at slide, I think, Bill, it's like the one that shows the parking. Um, Looks like it's slide 24. Um, the way we've designed and planned entrance, especially automobile entrances, uh, to enter the park via the 10th Street roundabout, all the parking, all the parking is north of phase one. Most of it's in the Van Wezel lot, which will turn into mostly green space and along 41 here in what um, Bill calls the arts and cultural zone. So every way we look at this, for those residents that live across from the park, 
on 41 or across from the park on Boulevard of the Arts, they should be fronting a part of the park that will be active, but will be enjoying activities that should be a lot quieter and not have as many people going there. Will we, do we know that? No, that's how we designed it, that's how we planned it. Will we know that? We will know that. We, a year from now, when we're standing here, we'll have a pretty good idea of at least what the first several months of park usage is going to be. So you've had time to shuffle there's, your cards. Yeah, there's one more maybe you address. Well, Ooh, I was getting tired. I thought you guys were going to do the next three. Um, oh, yeah. There was a question about, um, there is a statement in the implementation agreement that further additions to the Bay Park may be added at the discretion of the city. It's really at the discretion of the city and the BPC, not or. If it says or, we need to change that. But yes, um, Bill, which slide is it? Because I'll, I'll show the one that had the fountain garden and the west coast, and it was in your slides, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is what is meant by this. All of this, all of these green space additions that we've done that are essentially improvements of the current site that involve landscaping, that don't involve any structures, that don't involve any other activity, engineering construction that requires a site plan and simply can be permitted by the city, we've gone ahead and done with the encouragement of the city and the support and agreement of the Planning and Development Department. So for example, the Fountain Garden, you know, that was, I hate to say it, it was an eyesore, it was an environmental disaster, it was a cesspool, okay? And we didn't even know that the, we didn't even know that the original Japanese lantern, which we'd seen in a photograph from the 30s, was still there, it was at the bottom, okay? But that's the kind of project that we can do, the walkway, along the Blue Pagoda that connects 41 in the corner of um, Boulevard of the Arts and, um, and 41 with the Mangrove Bayou. This, um, this, all these new plantings, trees and landscaping along 41 that we got a grant from the state for, it's, it's basically just landscaping. Um, redoing the lawn, you know, honestly, we got tired of looking at the weeds up there and Parks and Rec came to us and we put our heads together and Bill and I walked over there and met a couple of people from the city and we said, yeah, we can, we can do this. And you know, two weeks later it was done, okay? Um, what Bill and we call the West Coast, that's mostly landscaping, planting trees, replacing benches and that, that aren't in good shape, frankly, you know, painting. Um, so those are the kinds of things that um, are intended by this sentence in the implementation agreement. And we're going to continue to plant trees. I mean, we've got a tree farm going. We're rescuing trees. Uh, before we're done, I don't know what the number is. Bill keeps raising it. But, you know, there'll be hundreds, maybe a thousand more trees on, on, on the site than there are today. But that's what's meant by this, by this statement. Okay, I've got a uh, few questions that I'll... Uh, jump into. Um, are there plans to monitor or evaluate late hour use in the park past 10 p.m.? Uh, concerned about noise, uh, sleeping, park activities, whatever. Absolutely are plans. We're going to, um, right now we're planning to have the same park hours as other, the other 40 parks in the city that uh, we're open from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m., so closed uh, after that. And just like other parks, we've um, uh, we are, well, in addition to what you'll see in other parks, as AG said earlier, we're testing state-of-the-art security uh, cameras and audio uh, that will, the whole phase one will be covered and we'll have 24-7 monitoring where um, it, we, there's, uh, through uh, the software, it recognizes if there is, uh, you know, activity that's going on um, after the hours between 11 and 5 and it triggers a human view of what's going on and then they can go on the audio and say um, excuse me sir or ma'am the park is closed Sarasota police have been called you need to exit and so we're testing that um, we also installed lighting in a way that all of the the lights in the phase one mangrove walk are fully dimmable 
and uh, by zone. So we can actually turn up a bank of them if we need to, if something's going on, if there's an emergency or something going on in the middle of the night, we can turn them up or we can dim them down. Um, we haven't decided yet whether at night uh, after hours they'll be completely off or they'll just be dimmed to a very low level, but the good news is we, we've got the ability to dial it up and down, which we thought was, uh, was really important. And then, um, you know, the most uh, important way to deal with uh, security in the park is to activate a park. I've, I mentioned I've uh, worked on over 30 parks, most of them in Florida. Bradenton River Walk up the road was one we worked on that had all sorts of uh, unpleasant activities going on prior to our project and in addition to designing it to uh, crime prevention through environmental design uh, uh, principles, uh, we, deploy, we activated it which handled 85% of the challenges we were having. And then we also did a number of other things, including um, uh, volunteers that helped give extra eyes on the park. Uh, we, uh, in that case, we had uh, off-duty uh, security. Uh, we hired an off-duty policeman that uh, rides around on a bicycle. Um, and so there are a number of ways that we can do that. But the most important thing is uh, activating the park. Um, and then again, we're testing the security, and so we're very mindful of, of the issues, and we're going to work really hard to make sure that we solve them. Um, uh, can you expand uh, the next phases of the park and how they'll unfold? We mentioned um, briefly some of the landscape improvements we're going to be deploying uh, this fall and early next year on the West Coast. Um, uh, we're already under design for the historic district and the, the new uh, canal district and boat ramp area. And so what I would expect is on the historic district, we'd love to be in a position in the next couple of years where we're building that and opening that. Um, and then uh, the up along the canal district and particularly the new boat ramp, that's a fairly complicated uh, process to build, to design and permit uh, through the state and feds, a new boat ramp while the old one's open and then replacing the old one with canal district. So that one's probably a four to five year uh, program. Um, and uh, so anyway, and then the last piece is probably the center of sort of the ring of improvements um, where the parking is for the Van Wezel, which will of course will remain open until the new hall opens in six or seven years, uh, plus or minus, and then we'll convert that to park. So west coast along the south side of the canal historic district within the next few years and then working on the boat ramp area and and then ultimately working on the the, the center there near the performing arts center um, how will we safe, safely manage swimmers snorkelers kayakers paddle boards uh, around the boardwalk um, and while motorboats can't dock there's a concern about safety and also uh, uh, curious about fishing um, from that location so um, we actually uh, have designed this, again, the southern end of the site is more for human-powered craft, so paddle boards, kayaks, canoes. Um, we're planning to at least post for signage where uh, there are no motor boats that would come up the mangrove bayou or that would be able to come under uh, the boardwalk. Some of that will be self-limiting given the elevation of the boardwalk. Um, and uh, it will be designed in a way that it has railings that doesn't um, allow or encourage someone to pull their boat up. I'm a boater. Those of us that are boaters, if there's a place that's designed that's unfriendly to pull up to, you don't pull your boat up to it. And so that's how that will be. Um, but it's the, the, you, the, uh, we really can't regulate um, how people use the intercoastal in terms of is this area for boating and this area for swimming uh, or not. Um, there, uh, and so, and, and we, don't, we don't intend to do that. Um, s uh, you can jump in the water and swim today and you'll be able to do that in the future. Um, but again, remember the, the, the west end of this uh, phase one is going to be more of a sort of a rocky, sandy, shelly beach that has been there for hundreds of years and will be there for hundreds of years to come. Um, it's not sort of a destination beach. That's, of course, right over the bridge at Lido. And so this will continue. Um, there's a floating platform on the inside where uh, we've talked about potentially we might take uh, small groups of school children out and, and wade out and, you know, look at the fish fry and the seagrass and whatever in the little lagoon. Um, and then human-powered craft can come up in there. And also, thank you, A.G., there's no fishing. We've designed it in a way where there will be no fishing permitted on uh, the boardwalk. However, fishing is a very important uh, free and historic 
use on the site. And so uh, we're actually working with a number of folks to help us. Uh, right now, some of the fishing that goes on happens at the, uh, that purple water intake structure that the city is actually ultimately going to be uh, abandoning the end of it anyway. Um, but we're going to be doing some improvements in the next uh, several months to, to encourage fishing there. We're going to add a fish cleaning station. Um, and a fish line station and what have you. And then it's certainly our intent to encourage fishing on the middle and northern half of the site and discourage fishing on the south end of the site. Um, let's see. Security we talked about. Uh, under what condition would the boardwalk be open after sundown? Again, the boardwalk uh, is a part of the park, and so the intent, like other city parks, it would be open um, from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m., um, and we haven't worked through exactly how will we intend to close it off in some way. And again, we've got audio and video security on the boardwalk um, that will be enforcing it like other areas of the park. And there's a question about can someone bring their, what are the rules about kayaking? Can you bring your own kayak? Um, the, it, it is, uh, it, while it's larger than the old structure, it is, it's a relatively modest uh, but ADA accessible canoe kayak paddleboard launch uh, that will be opening and so certainly folks are encouraged um, to pull up into that little parking lot or there's some spaces a long band ways away you could drop your paddle boards and then go park and walk back down and launch your own canoe kayak paddleboard that's what we suspect will happen uh, but Jeannie uh, and team are also working with a vendor to perhaps figure out a way where there's online on demand sort of drop off pickup of uh, paddle boards and kayaks and that sort of thing. So more to come on that, but certainly I think we're envisioning that a lot of folks will just sort of bring their own and launch from there. And, and uh, uh, Jeannie's also actually working on uh, a uh, sort of a few different routes that you could go, uh, so sort of trails, if you will, if you want to go certain distances. A uh, question about the uh, Water Management District and Florida Department of Environmental Protection Agreement um, and the relationship between them, I'm paraphrasing, uh, related to docks and board boardwalks and permitting. Um, and so when we began uh, to the permitting process a few years ago on this site, um, the water management district, the regional water management district, SWIFMUD is sort of the, the acronym, and then the state DEP both regulate um, uh, uh, water quality. And so we met with them and the decision was at the time DEP wanted to fund some of the water quality improvements uh, that we're doing. For example, uh, DEP funds uh, the water quality treatment for the Department of Transportation facilities like US 41 that don't have any water quality. And so we got a grant from the DEP for $330,000. It was on purpose to pre-treat the stormwater coming off of US-41. So DEP said, we've got funds. We'd like to co-fund this project, at least initially. So the Swift Mud, you permit it. DEP, we will provide input, but we'll co-fund. And then, of course, anything over the water, the Corps of Engineers, federal government, uh, actually uh, provides permitting as well. And so. There's definitely a layer, as is appropriate, of water quality and environmental permitting that goes on, um, but we're, we, we have got a lot of support for a lot of the things that we're doing on this project from these agencies, and so we're partnering with them together. And the, the note is here about, uh, I see from Audi, about a question about whether FDEP knows about the project. Uh, they certainly do, but happy to talk to you offline or after the meeting, um, and expand more about that. And then, uh, again, the fishing comment, which I completely agree with, that it's historically vital to a number in our community, including the African-American community. And so um, I have a number of times spoken to the fishermen and women that are up there, um, and we are committed to providing uh, much better fishing amenities and doing, uh, deploying things under the water that uh, attract fish, actually. Make it a better place to go fishing and bring your family and go fishing, um, but that's going to be more in the middle portion and the northern portion of the site. Uh, when will the Sunset Boardwalk be, uh, be complete? Um, as I mentioned, we submitted it for permits in the last month or so. That's a 12 to 18 month permitting process, and then we'll build it from the water after our phase one upland park is open. That's probably a nine to 12 month construction process. So we're a couple of years out from opening the Sunset Boardwalk, but again, uh, the upland park will stay open while we build the boardwalk from the water. 
question about the silt removal that went on uh, that, that is complete and is currently drying. Uh, we've not gotten the soil test back, um, but it's looking like we will likely be able to utilize that uh, soil, mix it with our soil, and sort of bury it in the phase one park. Um, but if the tests come back and they're above certain, uh, you know, thresholds that are very, uh, you know, clear, we'll then take it off-site to uh, landfill. Question about traffic management related to who's responsible for city streets and providing parking and traffic plans and all that. So um, the, the city is responsible for public rights away, which is Boulevard of the Arts. It's, of course, to the south end of our site, 10th Street. Um, and then US 41 in partnership with um, FDOT. All of the streets and parking on the site are, um, they're uh, city owned, but they're sort of private, if you will. So in a way, if you think about a, a shopping center, uh, all of that parking and drive eyes on all that are, are, are privately managed. And so in this case, we would do that, in, we would manage it in partnership with the city. Um, but we are working very closely with Mark Lines, the city's parking manager, uh, who works with uh, Steve Cover um, in, his, in his group. We've actually had three separate parking studies done on the site. And so we're thinking very carefully and working very hard and coordinating very closely with the Performing Arts Center, the Van Wezel and the new Performing Arts Center, on how we manage traffic in the future and how we convert uh, old parking that's draining polluted water into the bay and convert it to some of it to green park and some of it to new uh, improved parking. Some of that will go under the new performing arts center um, and some of it may even go across the street in a shared garage in the Rosemary district. And so that's still very much in discussion. Again, the performing arts center is by far the biggest generator of parking. Um, and so that's something that we'll continue to collaborate with the city and, uh, and Steve and his staff and uh, you know, our team in the Van Wezel. Uh, let's see, enforcement. Uh, where will people park their spaces once parking spaces disappear into the parks development? So that's, I'm sorry, that one is related. Um, let me just say that one thing that all three of our parking studies agreed on, uh, in the pre-condition, prior to us getting here, there are about 1,400 spaces, and all have agreed uh, that at build out, we need about 850 spaces or so. And so we know that we can over time reduce from 1,400 to eight to 900 or so. Um, and we'll be, do, be able to do that in stages. Um, and then what we'll need to do is a better job as cities sort of grow up, uh, you do what's called traffic management and you start to manage how people park, where they park. Um, to this point in the last hundred years, it's just sort of haphazard. And so a good example of that, in general, boat ramp area that has 115 trailer spaces is busy on a beautiful day and empty at night. Van Wezel lot, which is 800 spaces, is mostly empty during the day, busy at night during the season. And so you can imagine you could most of the time use the same spaces twice if you do a little bit of management and thereby reduce the impervious uh, areas that are uh, draining polluted runoff into the bay. And so we intend to do that. The good news is about our initiative is that as we build out in phases, we can make adjustments over time and see how they work and adjust. And so that's our intent. There's a question about city ordinances governing litter and smoking-free zones, et cetera. Parks and Rec, uh, you, you can't smoke in public parks. You shouldn't be smoking in public parks in the city of Sarasota, so that's, uh, that's pretty clear. Um, and there are littering ordinances and policies, too. I'm not going to tell you that public parks don't attract some litter, um, although we're going to try to um, by strategically placing plenty of receptacles clearly marked for different kinds of litter, recyclables, and trash you know, encourage people to, who use the park to do their part. And then as I mentioned earlier, the city will provide daily pickup and will provide enhanced um, policing of the area. So, I mean, we're very committed to clean, safe, and well-maintained. Those are like, those are the, that's the foundation of a great, of a great public park. Um, we also got a question, I'm so happy somebody asked it. No name, thank you very much. Um, about uh, are we still looking at a pedestrian bridge over 41? And the answer is hope springs eternal with the Bay Park Conservancy design, <laughs> design team. Um, listen, the whole, the whole issue of how one can safely cross 
41 uh, is being addressed on a, on a pretty regular basis and we're looking at a bunch of different options with our partners at the city and our partners at FDOT. Um, we're experimenting with things. We've officially asked the city and asked the state to lower the speed limits alongside parks, okay? This is a common practice in most states and most cities that have state, county, and public parks. The speed limits on state and city roads that are adjacent to the parks are lowered. So we would like to get it lowered to at least 35 along 41. We'll see if we can pull that off. And I guarantee you the speed limits are gonna come down on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the roadways inside the park. And if you've been in parks lately, some of the parks take them all the way down to 14 or 15 miles an hour because the first thing you want to respect is pedestrian safety, safety for the animals, cats and dogs. I didn't know cats were walked, but that's something I learned today. And, uh, and you know, all kinds of micro mobility bicycles. We want everybody to share the road. We want everybody to be safe. That's the, that's the simple answer. We are ready, willing, and able to test at an appropriate time uh, and over pass, over walkway. Um, some of the current discussion has focused on the new Performing Arts Center. Again, there are a lot of Performing Arts Centers that are either uh, in the corner of a park or adjacent to a fairly busy road, and the solution to getting people from convenient parking is to, you know, give them a way to cross the busy busy highway or busy the road overpass. This is not new. Um, again, it's, in, it's practiced. It's, it's a solution that's practiced in many cities. But there are a number of factors, and I would just say, you know, you should feel good that the city's thinking about this and thinking about making it a safe city for, for all of us, no matter how we choose to get around, and we want to do the same in the park. Jeannie. Um, so the first question is just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, someone asked if we'll be providing a list of the Q and A's. Um, and we will be, actually, Lori will be getting these cards tomorrow and she'll be typing them up. Um, and since we operate in the sunshine, those will go on our website. Um, and they asked if we would be providing the questions to the city commission. I don't know the answer to that. I think they would just look at them like anyone else. but. Um, but yeah, everything we do is, is out there and it's usually posted onto our um, website within a couple days. Um, can you tell us more about the Around the Bend Nature Tours at the Bay? So we kicked off a, a new program yesterday working with Around the Bend Nature Tours. They are um, an environmental or eco-tour company in town. They usually work with schools and families, um, but because schools haven't really been able to uh, do any field trips in the last year and a half or so, they were available. So um, we have them coming every Wednesday morning at 9 and 10 doing a nature walk um, through the mangrove bio walkway. So I'd encourage you to come. Uh, one of the questions is about volunteers um, needed for services, and I'm, I'm so sorry I didn't mention this before. One of the other ways that we can activate the park and keep all of our programming free is by utilizing the skills of volunteers. It's going to be a very, very important part of what we do. So I'll be building a volunteer program, and I'm going to come after all of you <laughs> and ask you to join. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll, certainly by the time we open the first phase in June, we'll have a, a group of volunteers who's going to help us in the park. And the next question is, um, will all of the events be free and open and accessible? And that is certainly the goal. Um, you'll see a thing here or there, for instance, we're working with Booker High School, whose um, visual and performing arts theater is under construction this year, and they needed to find a place to put on their performances, which are fundraisers for the school, a very important um, line of revenue to support their visual and performing arts program, so they'll be doing that in here, and those events are ticketed. But in exchange, they'll do some free programs for us, Shakespeare in the Park and a holiday concert, um, so you'll be seeing that. But So for the most part, I would say 99% of what we're going to be doing is free. If you plan to, okay, th these next questions are about events. Um, a couple people asked if we would uh, have private events or ticketed events. These are all things that we're exploring and thinking about. Um, 
you know, the way a lot of these, there are about 40 park conservancies in the country. We're the only one in the state of Florida. Uh, the way that many of these park conservancies stay afloat and pay their, you know, their operating um, budget is by having a certain number of private events. And so more than likely we will do that, but um, one of the guiding principles is to make sure that spaces are always open and accessible. So if one portion is closed off for a private event, there'll still be plenty of access for, um, for public access. So that's still very much to be determined and I don't anticipate that happening, happening very frequently. Yes. Yes. So, like, like any place, you would get requests for, you know, I want to have my wedding here. I want to have my baby shower. Um, this space, in particular, of course, the municipal auditorium, they rent it out for events. The room back here, the community center, is rented out for events. So there is a precedent, and there is a process. Um, and actually, that's kind of the next question, which was. Um, what events do we have to permit? So the rule of thumb is anything over 75 people you have to permit. And um, we do park permits for even fewer than 75. But if you start to have things that you're selling um, or food and beverage, you need to go through a permitting process. So like our Sundays at the Bay are not huge. We're not selling anything, and there's no food and beverage there. So that's you know a really easy park permit, and those are the kinds of things that we, the BPC, will be able to permit. Did I say that correctly? Okay, great. Um, and I think that concludes the questions that we got. So um, thank you all for your attention and joining us and being engaged citizens and asking rather than assuming. We always appreciate that. Um, anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.